Good morning. Uh, well, good afternoon, I guess, for you guys here. Let me share my screen. Um, okay. So I will talk a little bit. Uh, it's a very general uh, name, right? Thermal evolution of a neutron star. So there's a lot of things that I, I could talk about, but uh, of course, uh, I, I I don't hope, and I, I have very uh, low, uh, I mean, I know I'm not going to be able to talk about everything about thermal evolution of neutron stars, but hopefully I'll be able to paint a picture that is going to be familiar to, uh, to it's going to help a lot of uh, students particularly. So this is a, I, I'm trying to, to do this in a, in a way that this talk is going to be helpful for both students in a very broad general sense, and also for for to show a little bit of uh, some of the results that we have had just recently, more towards the end of the talk. So this way everybody can uh, can appreciate a little bit of this talk. So again, uh, I mean I was already introduced, but my name is Rodrigo Negreiros. I'm from uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm going to talk about, as I said, thermal evolution of neutron stars in a broad sense. And then I'm going to talk about a, a result that we have had about the relaxation time of uh, neutron stars and how we revisit this concept just uh, a few months ago. So this is a brief overview of my talk. And please feel free to, to ask questions. And I, I can't see here on my screen the questions, but uh, you, you should be free to, to interrupt me at any time. And, and the host would uh, certainly help me with that and just interrupt me if you guys have any questions. So uh, I'll talk about a uh, brief of a view of neutron stars and I'll go this very quickly because uh, I'm sure that by now with all the, the excellent talks that we have had, uh, you probably already have a pretty good idea of this. And then uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, uh, an overview about the cooling of neutron stars. And by neutron stars here, I'm talking in a very general sense uh, basically compact objects on a nutshell. And then I'll talk about the thermal rel relaxation uh, of these guys, which is a concept that's been known for a little while, but that we have had some interesting results. And then finally, I'll show the results of our most recent research, and I'll give you my conclusions. So uh, before we start, uh, okay, cool. Uh, um, okay, so this is a very, the, the results that I'm going to show towards the end is a very recent uh, uh, research that we have done. And I, I should give a shout out to, to some of my collaborators, particularly Tiago Salles, who is my uh, PhD student from who I stole most of the pictures in this presentation uh, with his consent, of course. And of course, Ojilon and Mana, which are two collaborators that work on the microscopic aspect of this research. So if you guys are interested, I, I mean, I can upload this uh, talk later, but uh, this is an upcoming article for astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, should, should, it's free access now. I don't know if it's gonna, for, for how long, but uh, this is the DAW. You guys can, can download the, the preview over there, the, the article over there before it's uh, actually published. Anyways, so, Brief overview, neutron star microscopic structure in a very broad sense. What we are assuming here, and this is actually okay for the purposes of the study of the thermal evolution, uh, we are assuming a static stationary structure. So basically for the talk, the, for this particular talk, we're not concerned about any uh, change in the composition or the structure. So we're talking about usually very well behaved isolated neutron stars so there's no accretion uh, there's no mass ejection there is a uh, basically the, the only evolution uh, to which this star it's uh, subjected to is a thermal evolution okay so we have a spherically symmetric metric uh, we assume a perfect fluid so it's generally speaking it's a well behaved object and of course we, we i'm not going to get into this but of course, there is a thermal evolution as we're going to talk about it. But luckily, we can decouple uh, those evolutions from the, the, the structure and the thermal uh, side of it. 
because of the scales of energy, okay? If you guys have any questions later, I, I can, I can uh, go into further details, but basically all of the thermal processes are happening in a weak scale. They're mostly dominated by weak processes. And of course, the equation of state is dominated by strong interaction, MeV on one side and KeV on the other side. So we can decouple this. So there's pretty much no effect from the thermal side uh, on the, on the you know, macroscopic structure. I'm not saying this is always the case. I'm saying that for the thermal evolution of isolated neutron star, this is the case. Of course, if we have mergers in those turbulent and very strong uh, high temperatures, and then of course you cannot, or you should not at least decouple those things. But for our study, this luckily is the case. And of course, the geometry uh, that we're gonna use is given by Einstein's equations, and I'm not gonna go through this, but uh, you can, uh, you know, from Einstein equation and you know some clever manipulation, if you assume a spherically symmetric objects, we can basically get the T of E equations and mass continuity, and uh, from here we can um, basically get the structure of this very nicely behaved star. That means we can get the mass, we can get the radius, uh, we can get the pressure profile, we can get the density profile, and if we have an assuming we have an equation of state, which we need. Once we get those profiles, we can get the decomposition, meaning uh, what kind of particles we have in which coordinate radius of the star, and then we can get all of this information. So quick, very generic, um, you know, uh, overview of the inside of a neutron star. This is going to be very important, particularly for our cooling studies. So we have most of the stuff and uh, I, I, I think most of the things that uh, we, you have heard in, in the talks up until this point are regarding the core. And, and that's, that's natural because this is the, the, the largest fraction of the neutron star and it's actually the, the, the fraction that we know uh, almost I mean, that we still have a lot of questions about, right? So this can go up to very high densities, maybe four, five, maybe even more, um, maybe even more, uh, uh, four or five nuclear matter densities, so maybe even more than that. We have a pretty good idea of what happens here in the interface in the low densities uh, when we are just above the nuclear matter saturation density. So we, we think we know what's happening there. We have protons, neutrons, superfluids, and things like that. As we go towards the center and the density increases, our level of ignorance increases. And that's mostly why we do this. We're trying to, you know, using all of the, the tools available for us and the observational, and you know, both on observational and on the theory side. So we have theory to, to model these objects. After we have the theory, we confront our predictions with observations, and hopefully we can, you know, fine tune this in order to, to obtain some information. So most of our job is basically trying to, to come up with clever ways of inferring what's happening in the inside. Okay, so so we might have hadrons, we have leptons, we have quarks, we have now a recent nice talk from uh, Renshin about the possibility of strangers, and then we, ha we have to, to investigate all of this, okay? And then we have the crust, okay, in the traditional scenario for neutron stars. And this crust is a relatively thin compared to, to, to the rest of the structure. So we have a radius of about, let's say, of the order of 10 kilometers. This crust is maybe two, three kilometers, a little bit less, depending on the mass. And what we believe it's happening in the crust is a very different scenario, very, very different structure than what we have in the core. Whereas in the core, we have this quantum liquid phase, no structure. In the crust, we do have heavy ions. So we don't have hadrons roaming around. We have a crystalline structure. So basically they, they organize in a lattice. Uh, we have neutrons, if we're in the very high density of the crust, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but if you basically, if we go, if we're above the, 
the neutron drip density line, then you can have neutrons, free neutrons. Of course, we need electrons, but this, this is a, a fundamental for, for the investigation of thermal evolution and the thing we're gonna talk about now. This basic, this very strong difference between a, a sort of liquid and a solid crystalline structure. Because of course, as you know, if we have, we have very different transport properties between a, a crystal structure, a crystalline structure, and a liquid structure with no structure. So let's go into the cooling. Uh, okay, uh, so why, why, why investigate cooling? Uh, well, cooling it provides an additional tool for probing the composition of complex stars, right? So if we assume that a certain composition and a certain uh, microscopic structure in these guys, uh, we can simulate this cooling and compare with a wealth of observed data, okay? So we, we, we observe neutron stars in several different aspects, right? Most of them we observe by timing, uh, using instruments as fast, the range we just talked about. So we see this uh, pulsating objects from which we can extract periods. And if we have uh, two of them orbiting each other, we can extract mass and things like that. But we do have some observations uh, regarding thermal neutron stars. So we have isolated neutron stars that are basically not pulsating, very faintly pulsating. Uh, but they do have this sort of black body spectrum uh, in the thermal spectrum, basically soft x-rays. So we do observe uh, hot neutron stars. Unfortunately, in order to do that, they have to be isolated. So we have no very little information about their mass, as opposed to, to you know, binary systems from which we, we have information from the mass, but then we don't have information on the thermal spectrum. So uh, why, why do we do this? So this is a traditional, you know, uh, step that we usually take we, when we do a theoretical, a theoretical study, right? We start with a microscopic composition model, basically an equation of state. Uh, from, from this microscopic composition model, we obtain an equation of state, which is basically bridges the microscopic realm to the macroscopic realm, right? Then we, we can model theoretically our, our objects from which we get all of this, you know, simulation, all of these results theoretically, mass, radius, and whatever else, from which we can confront against observations and see uh, if it's our, our, our assumptions on the microscope realm are any good. Of course, it's never so simple. We, we can never say, oh yeah, it's completely, it's perfect. We found it, we found the solution. We can, most of the time, say, well, this is completely garbage. So we, we can just discard this model and go to, to, to another one. But most of the times we just say, well, this model has some good properties and some bad properties. So we just fine tune them. But if, if we do a thermal evolution study, oh, this is black, sorry. This is nice because it helps us a little bit because now, now for the thermal evolution, I'm, as I'm gonna show, we're gonna need uh, information from both the macroscopic realm and the microscopic realm, okay? And then we have also a new set of data to which we can compare our results. So this is a, you know, a, it helps us further refine our, our models. As I said, things are never uh, very simple, so we never get a, you know, a smoking gun, a final answer, but that's just how science works. So a brief overview about neutron star cooling, and I'm gonna go into a, lot of, uh, a little bit more details. So the cooling is dominated by neutrino emission, at least initially. Okay, so we, we have uh, some processes that take place, some weak processes that take place ne near this, the Fermi surface of the particle distributions. So the, the temperature, even though we assume the temperature is zero when we calculate the equation of state, the temperature is really never quite zero. It's about um, a few key, is about, no, maybe, 
it starts at one MeV and then goes down from there. So between hundreds of keV. So we have these surface processes trying to, you know, lower the energy of the particles. And uh, then, then we're going to have this very strong neutron emissions. And of course, we're talking about objects after they leave the proton neutron star phase. So they're completely transparent to neutrinos. So once the neutrinos are created, they leave the star. We also have photons being emitted from the surface because, you know, this is a thermal object. And then now we have uh, these photons that are emitted. So there are some, some caveats here. We need to have an atmospheric model depending on a few properties, but uh, I don't have time to go into this. But basically it means we, we do have photons living from the surface. So more or less for the first thousand years, a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the star, the neutrinos are the main force driving the cooling. After that, the temperature of the core, it's low enough that the neutrino production is no longer uh, dominant, and then we have a photon dominated era. So, this is known for a little while. What, what's interesting too is the neutron stars they cool inside out, and I'm going to show this uh, very, very briefly. So, basically, since we have a stronger neutrino emission coming from the very core of these guys, and this is going to be also a, a fundamental aspect of uh, the things that I'm going to talk about towards the end. And so uh, since we have this very strong neutron emission, we're going to see that the core, it's colder, at least initially, than the outer layers of the star, particularly the crust. The crust, because it's a crystal structure, usually is going to be uh, hotter for a little bit of uh, time. So it takes a while for the crust to couple, uh, thermally couple to the core, as we're going to see. So this is the thermal equations, and there are several ways you can uh, you can write this. Okay, this is my favorite way. It's just the way I use and the way I learned. But you might see this written in different ways, but they're basically the same. So this is just basically a relativistic equation for energy balance and transport. So this traditional energy transport and balance equations except now we're using a background that's a curved space time. So we have corrections from the metric here. Um, again, we can do this because we can decouple the, 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 we have a static background. So we can investigate this in this way. I, I just changed rather than, than having this as a function of radius, we use mass, uh, which is a monotonically decreasing fun uh, increasing function of radius. So this is okay. Again, you, you might see this written in different ways uh, for different authors, but they basically mean the same thing. So here we have a little bit of information. So we have some macroscopic properties that come in here. So basically we have metric functions, radio coordinates, and um, the mass profile of the star. And we also have microscopic properties, basically, oh, this is wrong, right? This is the energy density, so it shouldn't be here. So basically, this is the neutrino emission, and I forgot to highlight the specific heat here. And we have the thermal conductivity, which is a fundamentally important for, for this study, okay? Of course, you, you can also add some heating source if you need. Traditionally, we don't, but uh, some objects might, might have some source of heating. Okay, so here's the summary. So we have microscope, macroscope ingredient, radio distance, uh, mass profile, pressure profile, density profile, and the curvature, or geometry, if you rather use that term. Uh, ingredients, thermal conductivity, specific heat, uh, neutron emissivity, photo emissivity, and pairing. So here is this very busy slide, so don't, don't, don't worry about it. This is just, just uh, some of the, the ingredients in a mathematical form. What, what's interesting here is just to see uh, this, this, these guys here, okay? So these are the main uh, neutrino emission process that may take place, and this is gonna be very important. So we, we have this direct hookup process that, that takes place in the core, but not always, and I'll get into that later. But if it does take place, you see that the, the, the magnitude here is much higher than the other processes, right? So it's about 10 to the 27 ergs per cubic centimeters per second. 
as opposed to the, to the second strongest one, which is the modified hookup process. Uh, this is basically for, for the, the purposes of this talk, we just can consider this direct hookup process, uh, neutron uh, beta decay processes. Um, the modified hookup process is similar to the direct hookup process. So those are neutron emission processes. Uh, the difference is here we have a uh, bystander particle, and I don't, don't want to get into details here. But, but you see the magnitude is much different, right? So this is a 10 to the 27, this is a 10 to the 21. Okay, so let's keep this in mind. Then we have Bremsstrahlung, we have a crust process, then we can have electrons, electron Bremsstrahlung, we can have positron uh, pair, electron, oops, sorry, electron positron annihilation and plasma decay, just basically this uh, solid state effect. So this is a graph that uh, a little movie that I would like to show to the big, the, 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 the cooling. Okay, so this is not completely what I'm talking about here because this movie was done for a different investigation. So we have, we don't have spherical symmetry here, we have extra symmetry, but uh, it will do for, for what I wanna show. Let's see if I, we, we can get it to run. And I, I don't think I can. For some reason, let's see. Okay, here. So here, let, let me go back to the beginning. So th this is a cut, right? We just basically took one quarter of a neutron star. So this is uh, the temperature in the surface, but I want you to focus uh, on the inside. Okay, so we start with the isothermal inside, just traditional uh, initial condition, and this should be good enough. And, uh, and, and we, let's see what happens. So as you can see, you have a very cold core due to the strong neutron emission. The crust is right over here. You can see that the crust is hot, right? And then we have basically what, what, what's a, a cold front expanding from the core towards the, the, the surface. Uh, so eventually the core becomes isothermal, but the crust remains hot. Of course, here, here we're gonna have asymmetric effects because we, we don't have spherical symmetry. Actually, this is for rotating neutron star, but the, the idea is the same, okay? And of course, then, then we have this falling down. Th those are effects due to, to rotation that I'm not wanna get into this. But what's important is this picture. So this is a snapshot, okay? Again, forget, let's pretend this is a spherical symmetric case and, and this is gonna be enough. So, so this is the very, early stages of evolution, maybe the first hundred years, more or less. This is what we have. We have a very cold core. Okay, so the core, the very center of the star becomes colder than the, the, the outer layers because you have a strong, let me put my, my laser pointer here. We have a strong neutrino emission coming from here. So we have strong neutrinos and antineutrinos being created at the core. They basically leave the star. They, they don't interact. The cross section is very, very low. The freeming path of a neutrino for this temperature usually is about 100 kilometers, if I remember correctly. So we have an object of the order of 10 kilometers. So all, all of them basically just leave the star with no, with, without any interaction. Very well. Uh, <clears throat> so. So the, the core becomes very cold. So we can imagine this in two ways, right? The proper way is that we're gonna have a heat sink at the core, okay? So this is gonna draw heat from, from, the, the, from the outside of this. So basically we have two heat sinks. We have one that's actually the space, right? The outside, the outside's cold, which is drawing photons and, and the star is radiating away its, its heat it's heat towards the, the, the space, okay? So this, of course, uh, cools the star. But it will also have a heat sink in the core, which is drawing heat from, from the, the, the outer crust. Or we can, this is the proper way, right, of, of, of what's happening. Or we can imagine, this is easier for us, I think, I think it's more pedagogical, to imagine that this is a cold front that's propagating from, from the core, towards the surface, okay? So, I mean, this is, a, this is a thinner, thicker crust. This is because of rotation, which I'm not gonna talk about here. So let's go to our results, okay? 
So we, actually, this is a very serendipitous uh, result that we have found because we were looking at something completely different and then we found this. And I'll, I'll tell you what we have found. Um, so basically, we were investigating, we were trying to find a correlation between symmetry energy and crust and cooling and something that actually didn't pan out. But we were using a lot of uh, microscopic models. And this, this is uh, from this work here from a few friends from 2016. I think they had a follow up in 2019. Uh, which they investigated hundreds, literally, literally hundreds of mean field models. And they found, uh, and they used all of the available uh, constraints, both from observations and nuclear physics. So symmetry energy and all of that, and the maximum mass radius and all of that. Uh, and they updated this in, 19, in 2019, including gravitational waves and all of the, the, the constraints and tidal deformability. And so basically they had this, from this school of microscopic mean field models, they have this very best ones that fit most of them. Uh, and then we took four of them. Actually, we took more, but then the, the graphs uh, became super busy. And then we just decided to do, we should show the results just for four, because basically they, they are the same regardless of the model. This is interesting because we have a very robust result. So this is just uh, for your information, and, and I'm not going to go get into details about this, um, this constraints. But basically, we here today I'm going to show the results for these four uh, microscopic models here. And if you want to have more information about this, you can look for these guys uh, from this paper from 16, and then there's a follow up in 19. So this is the cooling, right? The, for one particular randomly chosen IU FSU, okay? So nothing too, nothing much to write about if you think about it. And if you look into this, all of this cooling papers that are out there, it's pretty standard, okay? We have for low masses, if, if you look here, for low masses guys, a relatively low mass, we have uh, what we call slow cooling. So this is a surface temperature as a function of age. If we look for high mass guys, uh, starts with the high mass. After the, the onset of the direct nuclear process, we have fast cooling. So this is pretty much what we have. And then this is the compare. Uh, this is all of the models, well, these four models side by side. And so if if you look quickly, you're not going to see much difference. If you go into details uh, amongst these models, uh, and then you start to notice a little bit of difference, basically on the onset of the direct nuclear process and which mass is which curve. But overall, at least uh, qualitatively, they're pretty much the same. And this is repeated itself. You, you can get any, any mean field model with the same kind of, same or similar properties as this here, okay? And you'll find basically the same thing, okay? So there's no much here, sorry. There's no much here. However, let's go back to this. So this is a traditional cooling graph you find in most of these guys. One thing you notice, most of the, the, the cooling uh, papers and works and research that have been done for a good reason, okay? This is not a slight, uh, it's pretty uh, okay. You, you don't have this many curves. Okay, you just go from 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, maybe 1.4 mass, solar masses. You don't actually need to go into this very high precision calculation of the mass. We did for a different reason. Then we found this, this interesting result. We, we weren't looking for this, but we, we had for, for we're trying to basically come up with this fit. So we, we had to go to very high precision so this is very long simulations. And here's what we found. So if you look at this, this is a well-known uh, property of cooling, right? Around 100 years, a little bit more, a little bit less, you always get a knee, okay? So we have this knee here, okay? It's softer. It's softer for low mass stars, relatively low mass stars, and it's, you know, stiffer for high mass, okay? 
This knee is the thermal relaxation time. It's basically the coupling between the core and the crust. Okay, it's basically when the inside of the star becomes isothermal or almost isothermal. What we noticed, and we thought, hmm, this is interesting. For, for these stars here, right above the onset of the direct trickle process. And this has nothing to do with the mass itself, but with the mass at which the, the direct hookup press or actually any other fast cooling process sets in, the knee gets larger. And this is a logarithmic scale, so you, you can see, but this is very weird because if we analyze this, okay, and then there is a formal way in which it's been defined for more than 20, 30 years now, in which we can calculate the relaxation time of a neutron star. And this is basically given by the maximum value of the absolute value of the, the, the derivative of this curve here. So if we take this, um, if we take the, the curve over there and we calculate, and this is very tough calculation because it's all numerical results, right? So we have to run a very precise algorithm a very precise code in order to be able to calculate those derivatives properly. And this is what we get. So you see, this, this, this points here, they, they show the minimum or maximum, right? Of, uh, if we take the absolute value of this guy, of this. So this is basically the relaxation time. These thick lines here, they represent this, this low cooling stars, okay? This guy here, represent the, the, the fast cooling stars. And all of these guys here represent the stars with a very, very similar mass. So they're basically just above the onset. So what we saw is this, the relaxation time, and this was already known, it's, 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 it's longer, a little bit longer for low mass stars and a little bit shorter for high mass stars. And you can see this here here and here. So basically, but if we analyze this for stars just above the onset, we have this very large relaxation time, maybe up to 300 years, which it's a lot, at least for, for these studies, right? And what we notice is this, because most of the simulations basically just skip from 1.7 to 1.8 or 1.4, so we, we can see other graphs here, right? They're all the same from all throughout, and we have done dozens and dozens of models, and they all have the same qualitative behavior. What changes is the mass. So you can see here, I apologize, it's a little bit small, but for instance, for this model, all of these guys here are in the range between 1.7 and about 1.8. For this BCR, BSR8, they are between 1.1 and 1.45. And this is 1.3, 1.35, this is 1.7, 1.78. But basically, we have found, and this seems to be very robust, we have found this domain, this transient domain, just above the onset of the direct hookup process. And, and it doesn't even have to be the direct hookup process. The onset of any fast cooling process in which the relaxation time can be much longer. And this, this is, seems small, but it's really not because this is an interesting thing. Uh, and if we see, so this is a result, uh, it's a little bit busy, I apologize, I hope you can follow. But this is the relaxation time as a function of mass, okay? So for low mass, we have this almost linear behavior here. For high mass, we also have a, a linear behavior. This is known, right? This, it's been known for a while that we have basically this linear or almost linear behavior between the relaxation time and the mass of an industrial storm. What we have found is that if we have the onset of the direct hookup process, and we just didn't draw the line in this here just so, so the graph is not too busy, uh, before the onset of any fast cooling process here between this and this, we have this key, this very nonlinear behavior. And this makes sense because the onset of a fast cooling process is a nonlinear behavior. And we could actually fill this graph from 
end to end with different microscopic models, and we will find the same find the same thing. Unless, of course, we we take the direct trigger process by hand, right? If we say, well, okay, the direct trigger process does not take place, and that, that that's it. And th this, so what's going on? Why is this happening? This is an, uh, the first uh, thing that, that came uh, to our minds was, okay, this is a, a glitch. This is a problem in the codes in America or whatever. But, you know, delve into this. But it turns out it is not. And this can be understood if we took, uh, if we look into snapshots of the temperature profile of the star. Okay, so let's take B B S B S R eight for instance. And again, I'm going to show you later for for different models. We see that this is the same across the board. So let's take a low mass star. A low mass star does not have fast cooling processes. Okay, so so at zero point one year, the core, which is this region here, is pretty much isothermal. Okay. So what does that mean? That means there's no heat being transferred inside the core. There's heat being drawn from the crust, and this is the crust, okay? There's heat being drawn from the crust to the core and from the crust to the, to, to the outside. There's a little bit of a process here because the crust actually has two regions, but I'm not gonna get into this. So as you see, as time goes by, the crust becomes colder, 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 colder. And eventually you do have a pretty much isothermal star. It's never gonna be actually literally isothermal because you have effects from curvature, but for, for all purposes and effects, this is isothermal, okay? Now let's skip to a high mass star. So this is a 1.8 solar mass star. Okay, and then I'm going to show this side by side so you can see. For 1.8, you, you can see a very, very different behavior. Okay, so this 1.3, this 1.8. So see, 0 0.1 year, you have a region in the core that's way colder than another region of the core that's hotter. Then you have the crust. So basically, have three different regions. Why is this colder? This is colder because of the strong neutrino processes that's taking place in here. So basically you have heat being conducted from here to here, from here to here, and from here to there. And now we have this, this very strong cold front. So this is propagating towards the surface. So it overtakes the whole process, right? And then the star, relaxates much quicker. You see, here in this case, the star, by the time it's 40 years old, it's already at the thermal. Notice that here, it takes about hundreds of years old, hundreds of years, sorry, to become at the thermal. Now let's look at the intermediate case. And I know I'm, I, I don't have much time, but I'm almost finished. So the intermediate case is interesting because the, the, the direct hookup process is so strong that even if it takes place just in a small region of the core, as we can see here, it can affect the cooling. However, it takes time, you see? So basically what happens is this, we have a very large thermal region in the core and a seed of, of cold, if you wanna be poetic, here. So initially the star behaves as if there were no direct hookup process. So it, it kind of behaves as if you were a, a slow cooling star. But eventually this guy here reaches the surface. And when this guy here reaches the surface, you have this delayed thermal relaxation, okay? So here's side by side, okay? So this 1.3, 1 1.8, 1 and 1.4. So you can see the difference amongst them. So this is an interesting behavior. So we say, okay, so we have this transient effect. When the fast cooling process is taking place in just a small region of the core, we're gonna have this delayed effect. So, so we might be able to see a star, if we're lucky, showing a very steep temperature gradient at around 300, 400 years. Much like Cassiopeia A, and this was a source of discussion a few years back, okay? 
So usually if the star is older than 300 years, you shouldn't have a smooth temperature evolution, but we see that you can have a steeper gradient if you're lucky to get a star on the onset of this guy. So see, he, he, here's a very clear view. So here we have the core. So the core is this region. For, for a slow cooling star, it's very boring because it's pretty much at the thermal from the get-go. If we have a fast cooling star, then we have an interesting effect because you have this region here that's colder. So you have basically temperature gradients. If you have temperature gradients, you have heat transport. And then you have to have a star with just a seed of, of, of direct to compress, then you have this interesting behavior. So if you see here, where is it? Okay, here. This is the difference between these two cases here. So we have the direct to compressors here and the direct to compressors there. Then we ask ourselves, okay, this is not, then it's not a numerical artifact, it's actually a, a, a physical result. Can, can, we, can we determine uh, how small does this uh, kernel, and we call this the direct roof of kernel, has to be in order to, to have this nonlinear effect? I mean, how, how large can this be so we can go from this regime to this regime? And it turns out that they, yes, and this is a, what's a very interesting, a very robust. And, and then again, we showed for four, but we, we have done it for dozens. And they all pretty much behave the same way. So you see, uh, we have the, the direct kernel, basically this, this length here, needs to be below about three kilometers. After three kilometers, we go back to the linear regime. So after three kilometers, it saturates, and basically the, the thermal relaxation time does not change according to the size of the direct to the breasts. But before, if the direct to the kernel is um, smaller than around three kilometers, then we start to have an increase. So it's a nonlinear phenomenon, as it should be, because the cooling, in, in this case, is a nonlinear effect, and the direct to the breasts is a nonlinear effect. So we have this nice, interesting nonlinear. It was really nicely and well received. Uh, we have had not much trouble to, to publish this. So, so, so what's the outlook? So the core relaxation, and this is something that's really not much talked about. Uh, it's not so simple as, as we, uh, we thought it were. We, we have this unseen behavior, right? This has not been noticed before. There's no linear effect if you have this transient effect. So, so stars on the onset of fast neutrino emission, and here in this work, we focused on the direct hooker process because the direct hooker process is the process that, that we know more about, but it doesn't have to be the direct hooker process. Uh, and and, and now, now we're extending this study to, to other uh, processes that are also nonlinear. So for instance, if we have a hybrid star, right? And then and you have the onset of quark matter at some mass, so say, a neutron star, a star before 1.6 solar masses is purely hadronic, and after 1.6 solar masses, it starts to have the seam of quark matter. Uh, then it, it, we, we believe we're going to have a similar effect. Okay, so between this transition, once the quark matter sets in, we're probably going to have a similar effect. Uh, and other scenarios, right? And action cooling, and you can think of other things that might take place inside of a neutron star that might, you know, change this uh, cooling behavior. Uh, so this is, a, I hope this is, was interesting for you. I know it's a very specific topic. Uh, I find it very interesting, uh, but, but I'm suspect. Uh, uh, but at least if, at least I, I hope I gave you a, a nice and interesting overview of the, cooling of neutron stars. And uh, that's it, that's all I had to say. And uh, if, if there is time, depending on the chair, I, I can take your questions and we can discuss. It. Uh, so feel free to, to ask me anything. Thanks, Rodrigo, for this excellent talk and telling so much about complicated uh, cooling mechanism of neutron star. So I guess all of us have learned many things. So we have a few questions. So it is good to see people are still energetic at 6 p.m. here in India and <laughs> uh, there are 
a few questions. So let us see one by one. Mm -hmm. First is from Prashant. Is superfluidity relevant on time scale of the thermal evolution shown in the movie? Uh, okay, yes. Uh, so in this movie, particularly, there's no uh, superfluid. We, we do have uh, some cooling uh, with uh, superfluid that uh, I could show you, but it's not here. But it is. The answer, it is relevant. And we, we, we shouldn't forget about this. So this study here, we did not, we actually have this curve with superfluidity, but we, we decided to show without superfluidity. So we just have a pure, uh, you know, qualification of this delayed uh, relaxation time. The, um, the result with superfluidity, if we take into account superfluidity in all of this, is the same. However, what changes, qualitatively the same. However, the relaxation time is tougher to calculate because basically it softens uh, all of this curve here. So for instance, if we have superfluidity, uh, the direct hooker process still sets in, but then it's suppressed by the, the, the superfluidity effect. So this curve here, for instance, if we take this curve here, it will go like this, you will not go as, uh, as steeply down, but you will go here. But it doesn't change much the relaxation time. Okay, I did not show, but let me see if I can, if I can, uh, if I can write this here. Hold on just a second. Okay, I'm gonna try something here. I'm not sure if it's gonna work. Uh, let's see. You let me know if it does. Uh, okay, let me see if I can. Okay, here. So there is a result that's known in which the, the relaxation times basically alpha T1. You can fit this. Alpha, I apologize for the, the, the handwriting because I'm writing on my computer. Alpha is basically, I don't remember, but it's a function of mass and crust thickness. Okay, I don't remember exactly what it is. T1, it's a constant that depends on microscopic properties, micro. And that means it's, um, it depends on whether or not you have superfluidity, whether or not you have, uh, which kind of microscopic model you use. So, so overall, it doesn't change much the, the result of our, uh, of our, of our results, it just changes the way uh, the, the, this basically, if we go here, hold on, changes the inclination of this uh, regime here. So basically this becomes, uh, changes a little bit of the, this uh, inclination of this, uh, this part and this part, but the nonlinear effects right there. But we did not put this uh, after some arguments because, uh, it kind of murks everything, but it basically it's robust against them. But it is relevant. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks, Rodrigos. And then next question from Devarati Chatterjee. I think when you were showing your table one, so maximum masses for your equation of states are all below two solar mass. Yes, they are. Again, this was not the purpose of this uh, study here, but uh, they are still within the, the error bars, I think. I'm not, I wasn't the one who developed this uh, microscopic equation of state. And as I said, th this result for the cooling is really robust for any mean field equation of states that you have. But if I remember correctly, they updated this uh, paper in 2019 from which we used and they, they are, actually, if you, if you see our paper, we have a discussion about this because the referee actually asked us to put this. They are on the lower end of the error bars of this observed mass. Yeah. Of course, we're not taking into account this very recent one, which is possibly 2.5 or 3 solar masses that nobody really knows if it's a neutron star or a low mass black hole. But for the precise neutron star mass measurements, they are on the lower end of the, the error bars. But yes, they're not very, 
uh, they're not, you know, uh, easy, they, they don't easy go up to the maximum mass, but still there, right at the lower end of the error bars. Yeah, so I have in here a follow-up question. I see not only the maximum mass, but the radius for 1.4 solar mass, uh, 4, 4 solar mass is also very close. So it mm -hmm. seems all the four models chosen here probably have very similar uh, stiffness, right? So how about their no. mass radius curves? They look are they look very similar? Uh. Well, let me see if I can find this here. I don't have the mass radius right here, but they yeah, they don't. They they have well, you can see here, right? They they have different uh, the slope of the the symmetry energies is different yeah. for this UFSU, right? So you can see this. This is a very strong effect on proton uh, uh, on proton uh, fraction. So because of the slope of the symmetry energy is lower for this, the onset yes. of the direct Hilke process for this guy is different. You can see here, right? So the, the UFSU have a high onset. And this, we did this on purpose, okay? We took a model that has a very different onset of direct Hilke process mm -hmm. to show that our model, that, that our result is robust. So regardless of where the direct Hilke process takes place, you're gonna have the same yeah. results. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Okay, so the next question is actually forwarded from YouTube live streaming uh, from mm -hmm. Naresh Patra. Is there any chance of transportation between the particles of core and crust of neutron star? Is there any chance of what? I can understand, sorry. Uh, transportation of particles from core to crust. Oh. And not, not in this regime, right? I mean, we, we are very, very low temperature. So all of the process, we, we have no uh, matter transport here. Um, so you see, th there are two stages. Uh, we have this proton neutron star, which if, I, if memory serves, it's about one minute right after the, 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 the neutron star is born. In that regime, then you, you, you I, I don't know much about it, but you, you can have, you, you have transport of matter. I don't know if, I mean, I don't even think the curse is really well established in that regime because the temperature is so high that I think, don't think the curse has crystallized yet. But in, in that regime, you have to take into account uh, heat transport and matter transport. So we have convection and all of those things. So this is a different regime. After that, the temperature drops to about one MeV, then uh, all of transport of matter ceases. So for the regime we are, worried, we are talking about, there is no uh, matter transport. So there's just heat transport. So we have, I mean, you could have due to other phenomena, I'm, I'm not sure, but not due to thermal phenomena. Thermal phenomena here, it's only heat. There's no matter. Uh, thanks. So the next question is uh, whether all these are 1D simulations and uh, how much and what effect do asymmetry or rotation bring into this picture? Oh, this is a good. Uh, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Those are spherically symmetric, right? We actually have a code for rotation, okay, uh, which we have not taken into account here because it complicates. And we, we have a paper. I, I have a paper from what, what is it, 2014, maybe? I can give you the reference later about how much rotation affects the cooling. And, uh, and I can, can give you a, a, a preview over here. And I can point you to some of my talks online if, if you want to see later. But basically, depending on how fast the star is rotating and basically how much the symmetry is broken, uh, the spherical symmetry is broken, the, what, what's going to happen is you, you're going to have anisotropic heat transport. Okay. Uh, and basically, what's happening is you're going to have a thinner crust in the poles, a thicker crust in the equator, and you're going to have anisotropic heat distribution throughout the star. So basically what you have, and, and this is what we have shown, we have kind of two relaxation times. We have the relaxation time, well, actually three. We have the, the time it takes for, for the, 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 the polar 
direction to, to, to relaxate, the equatorial relax, uh, direction to relaxate, and then, of course, the, the overall relaxation time. But it's tough to define this uh, in terms of this. So we can just take the maximum temperature gradient uh, rather than the uh, gradient deriv time derivative over the star. But this is something we, we're struggling with. But, but it's, we, we can generalize, and this is what we're doing now, we can generalize this study about the relaxation time in two, in two directions. And that's basically what happens. So mm -hmm. next question is from Devarati. How would this picture be affected by enhanced cooling from exotic matter like hyperon uh, direct Urka process? Well, yes, okay. The hyperdirect Urka process does not affect very much because it usually takes place in a, in a, we actually took that into account over here. When we say direct hookup process, we, we take into account all of the direct hookup processes that's happening. But the, the phase space in which the hyper and direct hookup process, and among those, I think the, the most prominent one is the, let me show you. The most prominent uh, hyper and direct hookup process that does take place is the lambda one, which is the most prominent particle that we have. So basically lambda, into um, protein, if I, if I remember correctly, okay, plus an electron, plus an antineutrino, then I think we can have the inverse too. We can have a, a protein plus an electron, lambda plus a neutrino. Even this one, if I if if I if I remember correctly. Uh, has a very limited phase space, so it does not affect much. Because if this is happening, uh, the, the proton and the neutron direct hookup process is also happening. Unless you have a very peculiar equation of state, in, like uh, in which you have a very unusually high uh, presence of hyperons. But for all of the equation of state that we have, uh, that we have, that we have considered. And amongst these four, but the, uh, actually we, we, we have done for dozens, for actually uh, 12 equation of states that they have similar behaviors and that, that they're within the lower bounds of this maximum mass here. Uh, Hyperon uh, process does not, is not very, does not change the, the picture that much. What I think might does lead to a very similar behavior is if we have quark matter, like like a, like a hybrid star, and then we have the onset of quark matter. I, and I, my, my gut feeling, and we're investigating this now, is that we're gonna have a very similar effect, but I'm not sure we have to, to see. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So next Quark. question is again related to rotation. Mm -hmm. Do you think glitches would affect this relaxation times through change of rotation? If I think, uh, can you repeat the question, sorry? Yeah, it is about glitch, pulsar glitch, whether oh. uh, the glitch would affect the relaxation time. Uh, because uh, of the yeah, that's a good question, I'm not sure. Uh, actually, somebody asked me about this uh, at some point. Um, what I think might happen, I mean, and this is off the top of my head, okay, and I could I could be completely off, so I'm, I, I'm being very careful with my, my answer here. I think, I don't think glitches may affect the relaxation time, but I think the cooling itself may affect glitches, but I'm not sure. My, my idea is, and I discussed this with uh, some people in Italy at some point ago, uh, actually it was a CSQCD in L'Aquila, uh, in Italy in 2016, but we never actually done any calculations. If we have superfluidity and if we have rotation, uh, then you might have these vortices formed due to, to you know, rotationally induced vortices. And, and if we couple this to magnetic field, then and the cooling effect might affect the, the formation of vortices or not. And then it, this might lead to, to some manifestation of glitches. But this is all, you know, hand waving and I, I'm, I'm not really sure this, this might lead to anything. But uh, it's something we consider and I, I have to be completely honest, I, I'm not too familiar. I mean, I don't know into a lot of 
deep details about uh, physics of equations. But I think this might be one avenue that, that might be worth pursuing. You know, vortices formation uh, in this uh, 2D cooling simulations and, and see if this leads to something. But th this is as much as I can talk about it uh, uh, right now. Yeah, thanks. I think many of us uh, would be interested to talk to you later more about glitches. Of course. Mm -hmm. Because all Pulsar astronomers, we like to model glitches. So the next okay. question is from Abhishek. How do the nuclear pasta phase at the core crust boundary affect the thermal evolution? Okay, this, this is a good question. Okay, we, we actually have a paper now. Uh, I think it's on the archive. I can put the reference here, just in the process of getting, it, you know, the last steps with the referee, in which we, we, we analyzed this for a few past of phase models. What we have found, unfortunately, uh, is the past of phase, even though the, it does have very different uh, transport properties, um, because it takes place in a very thin region of the neutron star, right, in, in the transition between, well, we analyze the past phase between the crust and the core. And it's geometrically, uh, in terms of uh, radio distance, is very, very thin. So it does not affect the overall behavior of the cooling. So it, it changes a little bit, the relaxation time, but about five years, more or less, but that's it, not, not, not that much. Mm -hmm. But we did uh, see that. So uh, he also has a second question. Can the mm -hmm. strong magnetic field affect the evolution by affecting the quantities like conductivity, etc.? I believe, yes. This is a good point, something that we are very strongly pursuing. So I believe the magnetic field can affect uh, in two ways, okay? The first one is the most obvious one is because if you have a very strong magnetic field, it will break uh, spherical symmetry. So that, that will affect, uh, of course, the, the geometry of, uh, of the star, which will affect uh, how the heat is being transported. But of course, in that case, you need a very, very strong magnetic field, right? You, you need these super high magnetic fields that they're just high enough to, to alter uh, the geometry. However, what I believe might be interesting and is something that we actually are pursuing right now is even if you don't have a magnetic field that's strong enough to, to change, you know, GR and, 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 and the geometry, let's say 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 Gauss, uh, even 15, we know 10 to the 15 Gauss does not change geometry that much, but you will change uh, the electron conductivity and the electron is the main uh, agent of heat transport, okay? Even in the core, and the crust is the only one, but in the core, it's also because it has a very low mass, it's a very effective uh, agent for the conduction of heat. So if you have magnetic field lines there, and then of course the, the electron will have preferred directions in which you will navigate. So you might have an anisotropic heat transport. So the thermal conductivity, rather than, a, than a, just a scalar, it's gonna become a tensor, right? So you're gonna have a heat transport uh, described by, by a tensor that depends on different directions. It's a complicated calculation because then you have to calculate the heat conductivity depending on the magnetic field and it depends on direction and tensorial calculations, but it's something that, that we're looking into it and it might be very interesting. Thanks. So next question is from uh, David Alvarez. Can you learn something from neutron star mergers on the cooling process that you have discussed? No, I don't think for the cooling process that I have discussed, but um, some people, are, so for instance, we're talking about well, nicely behaved, isolated neutron stars, right? Which are the stars in which we have all of this data. However, uh, what I think it's interesting if you have, for instance, if you have a merger and it, something that's been hypothesized is you, you could have two neutron stars merge into this hypermassive neutron star, right? So you have this hypermassive neutron star. This, th those are theoretically known for maybe 20 years. So if you have a neutron star that's rotating differentially, so you don't have rigid rotation, you can get very high mass, even if for just a small amount of time. So these guys are gonna be very hot and they might have different thermal behavior. 
So I, I believe in this case, if you do have this hypermass in neutron star, if you observe this, you might get some nice thermal signatures. But uh, of course, this is a different uh, scenario than the one we, we're talking about here. So all the things we talked about here is for nice, well-behaved, isolated neutron stars, such as Cassiopeia A and all of the thermal objects that we observe. But I believe there's potential to investigate cooling in this possible hypermassive neutron stars that might exist even if momentarily after neutron star mergers, if they don't go directly into a black hole. Yeah, those will be interesting to see. So the next question is from Subhas. Uh, is there any observational evidence for neutrino emissions from, from neutron stars? Well, not directly. I mean, we, unfortunately, we, we don't see the, the, of course, we don't detect the neutrinos, but um, what we see is the photons, right? We see the, X, the, the, the luminosity spectrum of these guys, and they, they're, they fit relatively well with, um, with what we believe is the cooling of these guys. Um, Cassiopeia A is a nice example because it's, it's a neutron star. It's the only case we have in which we can we could over a maybe 20, 15 years track how the temperature of the neutron star changed within of uh, the same object. Most of the objects we have snapshots, right? We have an age or an age estimate and its surface temperature or luminosity actually. Uh, but, but for Cassiopeia A, we could see how the, the, the luminosity changed over 10, 15 years. And that, that of course, there's uh, room for several models, but all of the models within that, that are used to explain how this temperature changed uh, depends and rely on the true emission. So that's a strong supporting evidence, even if it's not direct. And even our model here could actually be used to explain also the cooling of Cassiopeia. Even um, so, basically, we, we we have several, even though some of them are most likely to explain why Cassiopeia is behaving the way it is. All of the the, the different explanations rely on neutrino emission. So I, I believe this is strong evidence. And now there's a very nice paper from uh, Danny Page. I think uh, Jim Latmer is also on that paper. I'm not sure, but uh, Danny Page for sure. Uh, about uh, evidence of the, the remnant of supernova 1987. Uh, so that they have this ALMA telescope in Chile, if I, if I remember correctly. They start to see these hot spots in there and they have very strong evidence that this actually is a neutron star. So again, it's a uh, strong evidence, even and if it's not conclusive. Yeah, I think you already answered the next request also means uh, Shurendra also requested to know more about observational aspect mm -hmm. so now now again a question forwarded from YouTube uh, live uh, mm -hmm. Zaina uh, is this sensitive to the equation of state if so uh, can it be used to add constant on equation of state Yes, I mean, I assume that this, uh, she means the results that we have found. Actually, it's not. I mean, th this is the, 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 the point. Th this result that we have found here, and I think it's best summarized over here, as long as the question of state has direct, has all of the possible effects that it allows it to happen, right? I mean, it's, the constraint is, it's a hyperonic, it's a hadronic equation of state, so there's no quark phase transition. We, we have this robust um, behavior, regardless of the equation of state. What I think it could be used is, if we do believe, if we do see a neutron star that has an abnormally late thermal relaxation, so if you see objects like Cassiopeia A or other objects, that are relatively old, by relatively old, I mean 300 years, 400 years, uh, and, and they have a steep uh, temperature uh, gradient. This might be, uh, uh, this could be potentially used to determine how pervasive the direct Tuca process is in these guys. But this is being very optimistic, okay? I have to be realistic. It's very tough to find objects 
in this particular regime, such as Cassiopeia, we were very lucky to find Cassiopeia, and not not to be pessimistic, I I, I believe that in our lifetime we're probably not going to find another one. But uh, I, I mean, you never know how our our technology will advance, and if we start to to be able to to see more carefully and get more information about the thermal spectrum of neutron stars, we could possibly use this to determine how pervasive fast cooling is in the core of these guys. But I don't believe we can use this to pinpoint the equation of state. We could use it to say, well, it, it could not be this equation of state because this equation of state does not admit fast cooling. And that, that, that could be used to maybe rule out a few equation of state, but not to you know, pinpoint, I think. Yeah, I think now we are really coming to end. So one last question from Manonita in YouTube Live. Mm -hmm. What is the typical energy of neutrinos escaping and thereby cooling the core? Is it possible to obtain high energy neutrinos at the very early stage of the star's life via the cooling process? Uh, the energy is low, uh, I mean relatively low, right? Uh, all, as I said, all of these processes are weak interaction processes, okay? So this is all of the order of hundreds of, uh, uh, for, for instance, for the, the initial years up until 20, 30, 40 years, there are about hundreds of kilo electron volts, so KEV. Uh, so th there's no high energy neutrinos, at least for these uh, thermal processes. Uh, for the proton-neutron star phase, I, I, I'm hesitant in, in say something more, more strong because I don't know much about it, but I believe it could have a little bit higher energy neutrinos, maybe of the order of a few tens of MeV due to the, the leptonization process that, that's happening over there. Uh, then you might have, but then again, in that case, the neutrinos are trapped Okay, at least for initially in the neutron star, the proton neutron star phase, at least for the first 30 seconds, the neutron star is not transparent to neutrinos. So I, I don't believe the neutrinos leave the neutron star very abundantly. So I would think not, probably not very high energy neutrinos coming from the, the proton neutron star or the neutron star phase. For the supernova is a different thing that I don't know much about it, but for the neutron star, I don't think so. But again, I'm not sure. Thanks, uh, Rodrigo, for this amazing talk and uh, explaining all the questions uh, so nicely. And I also thank all the participants uh, for all these questions and a live interaction session, which always success uh, of the talk. So thanks, Rodrigo, and participants again.